Kyan Anthony was Syracuse basketball's fourth commit in the class of 2025. That's pretty good. Now, here's what the Orange should do going forward. You are Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome into Locked On Syracuse. I'm Jackson Holzer, and thank you for making us your first listen of every single day here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day, and we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And folks, on today's show, we are going over the ripple effects after Kai and Anthony's announcement to Syracuse on Friday, because It is a very unique announcement because it could be the end of Syracuse basketball recruiting in 2025, and that's what we're going to talk about here on today's podcast. We are going to go over some prospects to potentially sign now in the coming days, prospects they might want to wait on, but we're also going to ask and answer the question of should Syracuse just be done recruiting in 2025 or should they keep chipping at that class, okay, because they got four players And you want to have flexibility for the portal. So what is the line for Syracuse basketball in general? That's what we're going to talk about here on today's show. But before we get to all of that, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. New customers can place a $5 bet. And you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Kai and Anthony on Friday announced that he is headed to Syracuse, giving the Orange its fourth commit in the class of 2025. Well done. That's terrific. Now, where does Syracuse go from here? Should they be done recruiting in 2025? Leave a comment in the comment section below your thoughts right now, because I'm going to get to them in just a moment. I just want to get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way for you guys. The early signing period in college basketball is still going on for another couple of days. It's from November 13th to the 20th. So that means on Wednesday, I don't know exactly what time, but on Wednesday, it's the last day for these 2025 prospects to sign early with their teams. If they do not sign by November 20th, then they have the next signing period from April 16th to May 21st. The reason why I bring that up is because First of all, all of the prospects Syracuse has in 2025 have signed. It's official. And it's binding. So getting these guys to sign is a big deal. It's binding. They're under scholarship for next season, barring some unforeseen circumstance. They're coming. Okay? All four of the players. So now, should Syracuse basketball be done? Let's first go over the case against recruiting more in 2025. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about right now is, hey, Syracuse basketball, you got four commits. You should hold off on recruiting. No more. No more recruiting, okay, in 2025. Really, the case boils down to this. You need flexibility for the transfer portal. It's the wild, wild west, and it's only going to get more wild. We saw it this past offseason. Players going, players leaving, and you don't know which ones are going to do it? You, you really don't know. Players can also change their minds. Some are more predictable than others, but you really, at the end of the day, have no clue what's going to happen. Malik Brown, it, it seemed like he was going to stay with Syracuse when the ACC tournament was over. And then all of a sudden, he's gone. He's at Duke now. You don't know. With the transfer portal, and you need flexibility for it, you need the minutes available for the transfer portal. When you look at Syracuse basketball's 2025 class, it's a relatively deep class. They have four players in it, and they're all going to be under scholarship. Okay, they're all under scholarship. They are signed. It is official. It is done. They have four players already. Who are those four players? You got five-star forward, Sadiq White. You got four-star guard, wing, Kyan Anthony, who you got on Friday. Awesome recruit. Four-star combo guard, Luke Fennell, and three-star guard, Aaron Womack. Four is a pretty deep class, especially in this day and age when the transfer portal is is a real deal. That's how a lot of teams build now. They build through the portal. 
and you don't know who's going to enter it. So you want to keep the minutes and the flexibility available. And you already have four players that are coming in from high school. And if you look at the class even deeper, two of those guys already are blue chippers. Hi and Anthony and Sadiq White. Two top 50 prospects. Sadiq White's ranked as high as 15th over on ESPN. He's a five-star. Kyan Anthony is one of the best four-stars in the country. Top 50 player. These are guys who are going to command a lot of minutes last season. You might have Sadiq White being the starting four. You might have Kyan Anthony being the starting two. So that's already some flexibility in the portal taken away. Now, they're elite prospects, so you're fine with that. But that is the reality. How many more high school players can you get before you start saying, I don't know if they might lose their flexibility eventually? Luke Fennell. I don't think he's going to be the starting point guard next season, but the scouting reports do say about him that he could be a day one contributor. He's kind of a hybrid between developmental and someone who can contribute right away. That's Luke Fennell. So he's going to be in the guard rotation next season. And we'll get to the overall roster outlook on tomorrow's podcast for next year. But you could also have a guy like Elijah Moore coming back. We don't know what's going to happen with J.J. Sterling. You need to have flexibility. And that could be potentially three guards already for next year. Who else? Aaron Womack? He's a developmental guy. So I don't think he's going to play much next year, if at all. But he's still going to be under scholarship. That is a scholarship spot that you are using on Aaron Womack. Got nothing against him, but that's just the reality of it. You got four players. You do need to keep some flexibility for the transfer portal. That is the case against recruiting further in 2025. But there is there are exceptions. There are exceptions. And I really don't have an opinion either way. And that's why I'm kind of breaking this up into two parts this segment. Here's the case to keep recruiting it. Okay, keep recruiting 2025. If an elite player wants to play for Syracuse in 2025, you don't say no to an elite player. And we'll get to the prospects that I'm talking about in the second and third segments of this show. But that's the reality. If an elite player says to Syracuse, hey, I want to come play for you guys next season. In the next couple of days, I want to sign my national letter of intent and be your fifth player in your commit class. You don't say no. You give that player the national letter of intent and you run. And the reason for that is because, yeah, you want to have that flexibility for the transfer portal, but if you can get someone elite from high school, what difference does it make? That could be a starter that you get from high school. And you have someone who's already locked in that can potentially be a starter or a high-end bench player right off the bat. Never know how it is with these high rank recruits. Sometimes they come off the bench. Devin Booker came off the bench for Kentucky. So that's really the exception. If an elite player wants to play for Syracuse, then you forego that, hey, the flexibility for the transfer portal because it's an elite player. And you don't say no to an elite talent. The other kind of exception to the rule is if it's a position of need, which we'll talk further on in the next segment. But if it is a position that you really need in your recruiting class, then I'm kind of okay with foregoing that flexibility. But it really just depends on the prospect. It's kind of like a a mix. It's a mix, if you will. I'm not entirely sure if I'm for or against if it's a position of need. You might want to wait. You might not want to wait. But it is something to consider. So I guess the one and a half exceptions to the rule is if an elite player wants to come play for Syracuse from high school, you don't say no. You say yes. Or maybe if it's a position of need, you say, okay, maybe we want to forego that flexibility of the transfer portal. So that's how Syracuse, in my mind, should attack the 2025 recruiting class going forward. What do you guys think of my opinion? Do you think that Syracuse, no matter what, should just sign everyone? Or should they wait? Leave a comment in the comment section below your thoughts on the class of 2025 and what Syracuse should do going forward. So that's that for answering 
the question about whether or not they should be done recruiting in 2025. Coming up, we are going to talk about prospects that, hey, if Syracuse can get them right now, they should sign them. That's what we're going to talk about now. And then later on in the show, we'll talk about some prospects that, hey, maybe Syracuse, yeah, they should still be interested in, but you might want to wait. You might want to keep that portal flexibility available. That's coming up here on Locked on Syracuse. Our friends over at Five Hour Energy know that being a passionate football fan or even a basketball fan isn't just a hobby. It's a way of life. It takes a lot of energy to power through all-day tailgates, touchdown celebrations, or agonizing overtimes, which is why they've created the Stand the Fan Five Hour Energy Shot with a special flavor called Fan Fuel. The energy shot made just for super fans like us, the fans who are first in the parking lot and who are last to leave. We see you. And you know what gave me my fan fuel moment this week? It wasn't really necessarily one moment, but it was this whole weekend was just terrific for Syracuse, right? They get Kyan Anthony on Friday. On Saturday, they win in football and in basketball. Very exciting weekend for Syracuse Athletics. Five Hour Energy knows that no matter what team you root for, being a fan requires heart, soul, and a whole lot of energy. Whether you're prepping for the big tailgate or ironing your jersey, your game day to-do list is always a mile long. And that's why the limited edition Stand the Fan 5-Hour Energy Shot is here to help keep you fueled throughout the season. What's your fan fuel this week? Whatever it is, do it with 5-Hour Energy. Available on 5hourenergy.com. Ship nationwide. This is Locked On Syracuse. I'm Jackson Holzer, and thank you so much for making this your first listen of every single day here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. This is part one of two ripple effect episodes after Ty and Anthony's announcement on Friday to commit to Syracuse. It gave the Orange its fourth commit in the class of 2025. And on the last segment, We talked about whether or not Syracuse basketball should be done recruiting in 2025, and I gave you guys the case for recruiting it and the case against recruiting it. So now, which prospects fill into which? All right, which which category do they fill in, right? The prospects that I'm going to talk about here, all these recruits, they're they're all guys that Syracuse has some sort of connection to, okay? Because it's easy to look at, a recruiting ranking site and say, well, why not Syracuse get this guy? He's like fifth overall in the country. Well, wouldn't he fit that bill? Sure. It it, would be great, but is Syracuse actually going after him? And you would know if they're going after someone who's that elite, you would know. Right? So all these guys that I'm going to mention, it's really three plus one. There's a connection with Syracuse here. The first one that I'm going to start off with, And if this guy that I'm about to mention says, I want to play for Syracuse, you give him the national letter of intent, you have him sign it, and you run away. This guy, Alex Constanza, six foot eight, 205 pound forward from Florida. He is currently a rivals and 24 seven sports composite five star recruit. He ranks anywhere between the 14th and the 21st best player in the country. So consensus, top 25 overall. He recently officially visited Syracuse. It might have been actually exactly a month ago he did it. But that was very recent. He officially visited Syracuse. There's the connection right there. However, there is a catch with Alex Constanza. Alex Constanza is currently a 2026 guy. And 2026, well, you got to recruit 2026. This is about 2025. So why am I bringing him up if he's 2026? Well, the reason I'm bringing him up is because from his from his words himself, he has said this, it's quoted, that he's thinking about reclassifying to 2025. If he reclassifies to 2025, I don't know exactly where he would fall into in terms of prospect rankings, recruiting rankings, and all that fun stuff. I do know this, that no matter what happens, he's a blue chip guy. He's blue chip in 2025. He's blue chip in 2026. He, if he were to commit to Syracuse, could be the best player in Syracuse's 2025 class. And at worst, he would be the third best behind Sadiq White and Kyan Anthony. I'm not exactly sure because his rankings right now reflect his 2026 grade. I don't know what it would be in 2025, but if I had to guess at minimum, at minimum, 
he'd be a top 50 prospect in 2025. He's really good. Constanza, according to scouting reports, he's long. He's an athletic wing. He's very smooth with the ball. He can shoot. He can rebound. He can defend. He's an all-around player. So if Alex Constanza says to Syracuse, hey, I want to reclassify to 2025 and play for you guys next season, you don't say no to that. That he fits under the category of if an elite player wants to play for you, you sign him. You get him right now. You forego that flexibility of the transfer portal because let's be honest, you might not get a better player than Constanza in the transfer portal. And the thing is with Alex Constanza is we could know in short order what he's going to do. He's got plenty of time. But that's why I mentioned at the very top of the podcast about the national signing days for basketball, the early signing period for basketball. There's two more days of the early signing period. He could make up his mind in relative short order. And if he does, he could literally make this announcement in like an hour from now. It could happen. I'm not saying it will, but it could. That's how quick recruiting can go sometimes. So if you're Syracuse basketball, you are trying to convince this kid to reclassify to 2025 and play for you next season and forego the flexibility of the portal. He's that good. He's that talented. He is a blue chip prospect. You don't say no to blue chip guys who want to play for you. So that's Alex Constanza. He is elite. If you disagree with me, if you agree with me, leave a comment in the comment section below. Should Syracuse just keep recruiting hard for Alex Constanza to play next season or for two seasons from now. Because currently he's a 2026 guy. Could happen relatively soon with the early signing period going only for a couple more days. The next one that I'm going to talk about here is kind of a question mark. This one I've been going back and forth on, this player, and that's Asher Elson. Asher Elson is six foot ten. He's 190 pounds. He's a forward or a center from Brooklyn, New York. It's tricky because he falls into the category of this is a position of need. Syracuse basketball, they have four players in their transfer, in, not their transfer portal, in their recruiting class, none of which are centers. Sadiq White is the biggest one at six foot eight, six foot nine. Asher Elson is six foot ten. This is someone who could be pretty valuable for Syracuse next year. He could. So, Do you want him to play for you next season? Do you want to keep recruiting him right now? He is a 2025 guy, so I shouldn't say, do you want him to play for next season? It's, do you want him to sign for you right now? It's tough. Because if you look, again, I'm going to give a further roster outlook on tomorrow's podcast, but Syracuse does not have a center on its roster for next year. Eddie Lampkin's gone. Naheem McLeod's gone. They're both out of years of eligibility. So you might want Asher Elson just as your banked-in center for next year. But it's tricky again because he's not the most elite prospect in the world. He is not Alex Constanza. He's not. This is nothing against Asher Elson. But Asher Elson is a low-end four-star recruit. He's rising, but he's a low-end four-star. He ranks anywhere between the 97th best player over on on three. So shout out to him. He did crack the top 100 somewhere. 97th over on on three. But on sites like ESPN and Rivals, he's not even ranked. And I believe on 24-7 sports, he's a three-star. So here's my thing with Constanza. Or not Constanza. With Elson. Okay, with Asher Elson here. I think that if you get Alex Constanza in the next couple of days, hopefully, I mean, that would be amazing. But if you do get Alex Constanza in the next couple of days, then maybe you hold off on Elson. But if you know that Constanza is not coming to you or that he's not reclassifying, then I would go hard for Asher Elson. I know it's very tricky to kind of navigate that. How do you say that to a prospect? But that's personally what I would do. That would be my plan of attack. Because I do want... If you get Constanza, that's five players. And you want flexibility for the transfer portal. You want minutes available for the transfer portal. So if you're going to get a sixth player, 
I don't care if it's a position of need. It needs to be an elite player. But if you don't get Constanza, then Asher Elson in the next couple of days, if he wants to sign with Syracuse, sure, why not? Let's take him. Because they need a center anyway. Okay, fine by me. So that's my thoughts on prospects to maybe sign, hopefully right now. Now coming up, we'll talk about some prospects, mainly one plus a wild card. Who should Syracuse wait on? Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get 150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Let's talk Syracuse football for a moment. They are a 10.5-point favorite against UConn on Saturday with a money line at minus 360. Syracuse football just pulled off an upset win. How will they handle being a favorite? Well, that's up for you to decide over at FanDuel. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Basketball season is here, whether it's the NBA, college, Syracuse basketball, Games are always, oh, they're not always, but they're generally very exciting, especially Syracuse basketball. No matter who they're playing, it's an exciting game typically. The way I get tickets for games is by using Game Time. Game Time is a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats, so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. My favorite feature is the curated deals. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On College. L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. If you're Syracuse basketball. And you're recruiting in 2025. We just talked about the prospects that, hey, these are guys you should probably sign right now if you really want them. That would be terrific. If you can get Alex Constanza right now, more power to him. Go do it. Asher Elson, a little bit of a question mark, but still, if you don't get Constanza right now, then hey, I'd be more than fine with Asher Elson before the portal. However, Right now, we're going to talk about a player and then a wild card of, you know what, maybe Syracuse basketball, just just wait on this guy. Just, just wait, okay? Maybe not sign him right now. I'm not saying never sign him, but I do not want to forego portal flexibility for this player right now. I don't. Because again, with the transfer portal, you don't know who's going to enter it from your team or from any other team, and you need to have the roster spots and the minutes available for these transfers, right? And we went over in the first segment and even in the second segment about, well, how would you forego those minutes and the roster spots? Elite player, position of need potentially. But on this player that I'm going to talk about, I'd kind of wait on it. Not that I wouldn't be excited if he signed with Syracuse in the next couple of days, but ideally, You wait for what happens in the transfer portal to happen, and then you circle back. And that prospect is Tyler Jackson. He's six foot two, 150 pounds. He's a combo guard from Maryland. If you remember about Tyler Jackson, if you are a consistent listener and watcher of the Locked On Syracuse podcast, shout out to all you guys, shout out to my everydayers, then you would know that this is. The same prospect that recruiting analyst Sam Lance, we've had on multiple times over at zagsblog.com. This is the same prospect that said, quote, that him and Kai and Anthony were thinking about teaming up to play at Syracuse and bring a national title back to Syracuse. They haven't won one since 2003. That's their only one in program history, right? So that's music to all of our ears that a prospect wants to come and bring us a national title. I think we'd all love that, right? However, Tyler Jackson is someone who I would wait on right now. I would. First off, there there isn't much of anything or any news regarding his recruitment anymore. 
There was a lot of it over the summer. There was a lot of steam with it. A lot of it was Syracuse. Now there's like none. And it's not just Syracuse. It's it's like a lot of teams. I, I don't know. I, I keep Googling like what's going on with Tyler Jackson and I'm not getting anything from him. It's kind of quiet on that camp. So you don't really know where his head's at, at least publicly. Second of all, Tyler Jackson at this point, if you look at Syracuse's recruiting class, he does not fill a need. He doesn't fill a need in it. You can make an argument that Constanza kind of does because you're he's your really athletic wing. He's your scorer. And he's a, he's a small forward. Sadiq White's a power forward. Kai and Anthony's a shooting guard. You can make an argument Constanza does. Asher Elson is definitely a need. Tyler Jackson is not. Syracuse already has a combo guard in Luke Fennell. Now, maybe Tyler Jackson is better, but you already have someone there who's a pretty good prospect. You also have a shooting guard in Kai and Anthony. So you're good on that front. And third of all, this is really the most important part. Is he elite enough to where you would say it doesn't matter? Is he elite enough? And to that, I would say he's not. He's trending downwards in his recruitment. That's the reality. He is not the same blue chip prospect he might have been over the summer. And the recruiting rankings reflect that. He ranks still as high as 58 over on ESPN. 58 is really good. But on on three, he is downgraded all the way to a three-star recruit in their most recent update. All the way down to a three-star at 131 overall in the country. So he's kind of got a wide range, anywhere between 58 and 131. And ESPN is also relatively new with their update as well because Sadiq White had that update where he's 15th. So he's got a wide range. But what I'm saying with Tyler Jackson is that I don't think he's blue chip enough. I don't think he's elite enough to where you would say, let's give him, well, like, let's give him a scholarship right now. And our guards for next season could be him and Kyan Anthony and Luke Fennell and Elijah Moore. And with that, what do you do about the transfer portal? Then it like you don't need a guard in the transfer portal, but is your guard rotation good enough to where you would say it doesn't matter? I would argue it would not be. That you would want to bring in a transfer portal guard because there's going to be good ones probably available. So you want to have those minutes and that roster spot available. So with Tyler Jackson, I would say with him, ideally... You wait for the transfer portal to clear up. So you assess your roster. You know what you still kind of need. And if you need that additional guard who can give you good minutes probably next season, then that's when I would say, Tyler Jackson, you're our guy. You're our guy. I just wouldn't do it right now. I would not lock yourself in right now. It's not that I wouldn't be excited to get him. It's just, it's a numbers game. And it's a minutes game. And you want to have, again, I can't keep saying it enough because it's super duper important. You want to have that flexibility for the transfer portal. Oh, by the way, JJ Starling. That's another guy who could be in the guard rotation next season. I don't know if he's going to be back or not. Do you really want to give it that final spot potentially to Tyler Jackson right now? I'm not so sure. The next thing to wait on is a wild card. This is very general. I understand. But this is a prospect who's kind of under the radar. Usually it's a project guy. This is someone that is not going to be top 20 in the prospect rankings. This is not someone who's, oh my goodness, he's coming out of the blue and look at his recruiting ranking. He's top 20. No, that's not typically how it works. Players in the past that have kind of fit the profile I'm talking about that have committed to Syracuse recently, Luke Fennell, probably the best of them all right now. Aaron Womack, he's a developmental guy. Did any of us really know truly much about Aaron Womack? Not really. Peter Mastrovich. How about him? We'll talk about Peter Mastrovich in a second. And William Patterson. Developmental guys. Wild cards. Projects. People that are not, when you Google rankings, they're not in your top 100. I have no problem with developmental guys. None. I just wouldn't sign another one right now. I don't see the point in doing that. And sometimes they do develop. 
right? Jesse Edwards was a project guy. He developed. But right now, I would not sign another project guy. There's no need to sign one right now. Wait. Wait for the transfer portal to clear up and see how many roster spots you have available. The, the best example of it is literally from this past offseason. Everything cleared up. The dust settled. The transfer portal was done. We're kind of in the dog days of the summer. Football season is coming. It's mid-August. And then, boom, we get the news that Syracuse basketball gets its third commit in the class of 2024, and that was Peter Mastrovich. It was mid-August when it happened. Kind of a project guy. He's playing a little bit this season, and I hope he can get better, and I think he will get better. I think he can be a pretty good player for Syracuse basketball, but he is kind of a developmental guy. And the reason why Syracuse basketball did it was, A, they see something in the player. That's good. You want to be able to have a vision for someone. But, B, it's because when the transit portal and everything settled, Syracuse basketball had two open scholarship spots remaining. One of them they didn't use. And the other one they used on Peter Mastrovich. So there you go. That's what I'm saying with a wild card, right? You wait for literally everything to clear up. And then if Syracuse has a couple of roster spots available, all the minutes are pretty much taken anyway, you could go and get and say, hey, let's find a, a three-star guy from Australia or Serbia or Europe or whoever, I don't care where, from the United States and say, you're going to come to Syracuse. You're going to be probably on the bench, but you're going to be under scholarship. You're going to get NIO money, which is cool. Can't say no to NIO money, but you're going to be a developmental guy. I got no problem with that. I would just wait to do that for after the portal. That's the time to say, okay, we need this. So that's that for Syracuse basketball recruiting going forward in 2025. As far as what is coming up in the podcast, I've said a couple of times, kind of subtly, but I've said this a couple of times. This is part one of two of the ripple effects after the Kyan Anthony commitment. This was part one. Part two is coming tomorrow. When I talk about a way too early roster outlook for 2025 and 2026. No, it's not and 2026. 2025-26. Next season, I should say. Okay? Sound good? A roster outlook for next year because who's going to go who's going to stay who is uncertain that's what we're going to talk about on tomorrow's podcast and hopefully that can kind of fill in the blanks and some of your questions from this episode thank you for making locked on syracuse your first listen today for your second listen check out the locked on acc podcast alex donald and kenton gibbs they keep it real and they bring you the truth about where your favorite conference team stands within the acc Find Locked On ACC on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And folks, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you all so much for listening. If you like this video, click that like button. If you really liked it, subscribe to the channel. Turn on those notifications so you know right away when I am dropping the next podcast. I'll see you all tomorrow for part two.